We are underway. John McWhorter, welcome to The Glenn Show. Thank you, Glenn. I think we're going to have to call it the Glenn and John Show, man, because uh, a lot of the... A lot of the praise that our uh, effort here, our humble effort at the Glenn Show is able to um, engender uh, is praise for Glenn and John. I've never understood what what the big deal was. I, like, I love the Glenn Show, especially with John McWhorter is what the typical comment of that kind would say. And you know, all we're doing is the same thing we've been doing since 1958, but I'm glad people enjoy it. So, yeah. Right. The black guys at bloggingheads.tv, maybe that contributes to our cachet. <laughs> Glenn Lowry here at Brown University, a professor of economics and of international and public affairs. Uh, I should mention that the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs sponsors the Glenn Show. John McWhorter of Columbia University, professor of the humanities, linguist extraordinaire. And uh, we're here. You're in New York City um, again. You know, I repeat, because the last time we were on together, uh, that's how I started out, but you're right at ground zero, man. Half of the uh, COVID-19 cases, as I understand it, in the country uh, are right there in the New York City. We are uh, right here in it. Yeah, it's funny. I um, I read those news stories, and I think, yeah, I'm right, right in the middle of that. And you, I must admit, it really does make me think about the varying conditions in this area. These four neighborhoods are always called very diverse. And you live in Queens, right? Queens, and this is, it's Jackson Heights, Elmhurst, East Elmhurst, and Corona. Those are my stomping grounds. That's where my life is when I'm not at Columbia. And the, um, the socioeconomic diversity is amazing, too, but the poor people in this neighborhood are really suffering, you know, not having access, regular access to health care, living nine and ten to a house, and, you know, just getting by. You can't avoid people. Like, it's easy for me to stay in. I've got a seven-room co-op, you know, apartment. But they, you know, imagine staying in. One, you don't want to because it's cramped. And even if you do, you're all over other people. And you have jobs that you can't quit because you need the money that are service jobs where you have endless contact with other people. It's really serious in this neighborhood. The hospital that I would go to if I sprained my ankle or something like that, I could practically shout to it and be heard, is clogged with people who are sick and dying. Yes, this is this is real. Who are those people? I mean, by demography, uh, ethnicity, they, race, and so on. They are, I'm going to improvise here, but they are mostly Latino, um, South Asian, and some Chinese, depending on, you know, what they do for a living. It's mostly people of that demographic. So it's not, watch it, I'm going to start coughing tomorrow, but it's not me. It is not people who listen to NPR. It's mostly people who are, you know, living out there in the world and have a much harder time avoiding the plague than somebody like me. But it's very, it's very real. Okay, well now, you know, as everybody listening to the show knows, race has been our beat uh, since we've uh, first started coming on, back when Obama was running for the nomination to <laughs> run for president in the Democratic Party back in 2008. That's when you and I started this uh, partnership. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, as you must be aware, there's been a lot of discussion about the racial disparities and especially the high uh, cost to African-American communities of the pandemic. Uh, what, what are you thinking about that? Well, you know something? We brought that up. And I think that um, at least from me and maybe from you, there was an air of, oh, there, that shit's going to go again. And this is a week ago. And I want to be clear that I don't, it's funny how quick, right after we finished, all of a sudden the reports started coming. It's almost like they heard us or something. And the thing is, it's true. I mean, there is this disparate impact. You can say that the death rates, the sickness rates for this virus are revealing of fault lines in our society, of disparities in our society that we've heard about for many other reasons in many other ways. This is one more way that we can see that America in many ways is not fair. And I would not poo-poo anybody for putting that out. And so for example, I'm gonna admit this. Once one of the bigger reports like that came out from one of the bigger writers, and I'm not gonna specify who they were, but I tweeted- We all know who they are, we all know. <laughs> yeah, you got three it. names, remember? That's, that was your innovation, the people with three names. <laughs> I'm not gonna say who it was. But, 
<laughs> I tweeted something. And I don't do snarky Twitter for the most part. I really, I don't mean to sound sanctimonious. I genuinely cannot believe how many, especially careful, educated people are so mean on Twitter all day long. But I tweeted out something like, yep, right on time. And then I thought, no, what does that mean? And it's the only tweet I've ever deleted. You know, I am at their ways to go back and find it. But I just thought, I don't want that out there. I'm not going to snark about this because, yes, this is revealing these disparities. And the writer who did this, I've got some issues with that person's general perspective, but that snark was wrong. And so I, I pulled it. What do you what do you think? Okay, so I'm gonna name names. Uh Nicole Hannah Jones had a uh long almost essay by Twitter uh that circulated widely in which she was uh, uh detailing the extent to which African American communities had been disproportionately hit and offering up uh accounts about why that might be so People have to take public transportation because they don't have private vehicles, and so they're exposed. People have jobs that they can't telecommute to, and so they're exposed. People have pre-existing health conditions that reflect the fact of their poverty and their uh, marginality, and so they're exposed, and so on. Charles Blow had a column in the uh, New York Times where he writes regularly in which he recounted uh, the racial dif- disparity in the incidence of the uh, mortality and morbidity induced by COVID-19. Uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates has uh, very recently appeared on Chris Hayes' uh, show at MSNBC uh, in a, an extended interview in which he, uh, again, reiterated the at the root of the disparity problem, the role of white supremacy in American history as a factor uh, bringing all this about. So, And there must be many, many others um, whom we haven't uh, explicitly named. Um, I share your sentiment. I did not. I did not. I repeat for a third time. I did not snarkily, publicly (laughs) criticize any of these people. And I'm grateful that I did not. (laughs) I did say when you and I discussed this last time that I thought it would sound a little thin, a little tinny to play the race card in the midst of this general pandemic. Surely there are many communities like those immigrant communities near you in Queens, which may not be African-American, but which are also being hit. Surely there are many poor white communities in West Virginia or Kentucky or wherever it might be. I don't want to be stereotypical. Many uh, low income people who happen not to be black or brown or yellow were also being hard hit. So I had thought that the race dimension of this issue would not be the way that you'd want to lead it in terms of public discourse. Uh, We're all in this together, Americans. This is a national catastrophe, both public health and economic. Uh, This is a time to pull together. We don't want our president giving nightly briefings in which he goes into partisan rants. And we don't want our journalists and commentators uh, repairing to their, you know, particularisms and their identitarian postures when the country is so uh, encumbered. I had thought, and I do still embrace that sentiment, but I was having a conversation with a conservative African-American uh, good friend of mine recently. I don't want to name who this person is. And the person said something like um, the racial grievance industry is about to get out there and grind its ax again. And I thought, man, you know, given the scope of the devastation that is befalling these communities, I mean, people are dying. OK, you can read it on the newspaper front page every day in the local news, as well as the national media, people are dying, people are suffering. There is a disparity. There's a higher rate of death. There's a higher rate of incidence of the disease. There's greater exposure. It depends on class. It also depends on race. Uh, Certain communities, given the way that they're structured in terms of the density of population, how people are living, I don't know what a housing project looks like. And God help me, I don't know what a public jail looks like. I actually am going to interview a, I'm going to interview a public health doc who works in prison health uh, in a few days, um, put it up here at the site because I want, an, I want an expert to help me understand what's going on in the jails and prisons of this country with confined people who are susceptible to this thing. And, you know, there's no place for them to go. So given the scope and the scale of the, de- of the devastation, the last thing you want to do is go wagging your finger in the face of somebody who calls attention to the disparity. Yeah. Now, I, I don't want to call it racism because the virus is not racist. There are pre-existing differences in the social positions of people that correlate with race and that have historical antecedents that are definitely rooted in race. Uh, 
To the extent that that's so, my question would be, how is it relevant to what it is we need to do right now to solve the problem? If you tell me as a public health doc that I'm contact tracing and racial networks are highly segregated, and if I see somebody's got it, I want to know where they live, who they commiserate with, what's their family, who's in their household, and that's a racial issue, I'm with you. If you say I need to collect statistics so that I can be on top of how the virus is actually working and some of those statistics are racial, I will not stand in your way. Okay. If you tell me that I need to uh, uh, buttress the supports that we're giving to people who are especially vulnerable, I'm for that, although I would be quick to point out that many of those people, perhaps even most of them, are not Black. And therefore, the response that we're considering is not mainly a response to the racial condition of people, but to the social and economic condition of people. I'm with you 100 percent. But in the same way that I would say now is not the time for Colin Kaepernick to take a knee. That's a metaphor, people. I mean, now's not the time for some race car grandstanding. Now is also not the time for people like ourselves, typically given to dismissive critical reactions to those who would make a big deal out of racial disparities, uh, to get into get on some ideological high horse and start uh, wagging our fingers at those people. Yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, it's- And um, I'm glad you retracted that tweet, John, because I need yeah. you as a partner in the years ahead, man. <laughs> Don't ruin your reputation. <laughs> I had to, no, it was it was because yeah, we're stuck at home, and I thought I'm gonna Moment do what everybody weakness. else does. And then I just thought no, but the um, this is the thing about it though. I these disparities are based in considerable part on you know disparities in society that we have talked about before, and I think that we can take from the virus that it is urgent that we do something about those things. And yeah, I want to hear what the game plan is. And so I've always thought, you and I disagree about this, but the whole war on drugs, or I've often written that in education, children need to be taught to read more effectively, especially poor kids who don't have books in their home, talking about the availability of contraception. I think a lot of those things would change black America. And if this virus helps us talk about proactive strategies like that, then I say that that might be an ironically good thing that could come out of this. But what worries me is that and I just say worries because I don't have a crystal ball, but I feel like the, the quote unquote people with three names are going to say this shows that America is based on, you know, white supremacy, et cetera, et cetera. And let's say that it does. But that alone doesn't help anybody. And so it seems to me that if their end game is to say America is a racist place and always has been and it's deep in the fabric. And this is one more thing that shows that. And then you break for a commercial and that's it. I'm not sure that's what civil rights is supposed to be. It's supposed to be, here's what we do to make it so that when this happens again, and it will, there are not such disparate rates of deaths and that this is something that we can do to be societally proactive. It worries me to death that the quote unquote person with three names is response to that is to start talking about 1619. So the next thing they're going to say is this will bring us back to what we got interrupted saying. You know, during this virus, it all goes back to 1619. Okay, person with three names. Let's say that that's true, which frankly, it's a hopelessly oversimplified view of history. But let's yeah. pretend that that's true. Now what? And it just seems to me that we've got this whole industry of people who think and write for a living where they think that just pointing that out is as proactive as, you know, shepherding into existence a program that actually changes people's lives. And I know they would say, well, I'm doing my part and the people who are on the ground can do their part. But a lot of what they're saying doesn't even seem to lead to what you would do on the ground. This is not like Rustin giving out plans. That worries me about that intelligence here. Well, it may be where they start and not where they end. They start by calling attention to disparity and let's give them a, let's give them a month or two before we dismiss that they haven't got anything useful to say about what to do about it. I mean, because I think there's a lot to say about what to do about it. So, for example, schools are closed. Now, we know that there's an educational uh, achievement gap, you know, in terms of testing and all of that. Who's going to lose the most when schools are closed? The kids who don't have not only Internet connections where they can continue distance learning, but who don't have resourceful parents who are in a position to be able to supplement whatever the other resources are and making sure that their kids learn their reading, writing, and arithmetic. No disrespect intended to the parents. Not every parent is good at that. Not every parent has time or inclination to do that. Not every parent has well, the education. You know, yeah. Yeah. So, so, 
if there's a racial disparity in the consequences of a school shutdown, which means that the kids who are going to fall most behind are African-American kids, we could be thinking about what it is that might be done about it, what might be done by the public school system, the teachers and the superintendents, and what might be done by the communities, if I may, the churches and the civil or civic organizations and the volunteers and, and all the rest. I mean, that's, uh, a, um, it seems to me, a fertile area for some kind of creative thinking about intervention. Another thing I'll mention is social distancing. Um, you know, I don't know any facts about this, and I don't want to be misunderstood. I'm not accusing any community of not practicing social distancing. What I'm saying, however, is that social distancing doesn't come naturally to anybody. It's not human. No. It, it, it may be very hard to do if you live in a tenement where there are, you know, close connections up and down the way and whatnot. It may be hard to do if you live in a um, multi-generational household where you've got older people and younger people going on. Maybe very hard to do if you are, if your job is one of those jobs that you have to get out of your house and go and do it right now. Mm-hmm. Social distancing might be hard. <laughs> Hygienic practices, you know, I mean, very basic kind of stuff: washing your hands, et cetera, wearing the mask, et cetera. Again, please don't misunderstand me. I am not casting aspersions, but I'm looking for opportunities for those who are concerned about the well-being of a particular community, in this case, African-Americans, to enter into the uh, productive part of this reaction to the pandemic by counseling, getting the word out, uh, encouraging public uh, service announcement. I mean, athletes and entertainers who are have cachet, have leverage with people, could be saying things that would be very useful to be heard by uh, people in communities that are especially hard hit about how it is that we are going to get through this thing together. Now, that does not excuse the government from the provision of resources. People need health care and access to doctors. It, It does not excuse misinformation coming from anybody who's a public official like the president of the United States who might stand up in a press conference and say something that's not true. I'm not excusing any of that. But I'm saying, you're concerned about racial disparities? Okay, having noted the existence of them, let's now move the conversation to the next step. Having demanded that the public pay attention to that, fine. Let's now talk about exactly what should be done in virtue of the disparity that will be useful here. Yeah, and I think, I don't think that's an unreasonable thing to Think about. And once again, I can imagine somebody saying, no, my job is to be an intellectual and to take the large picture and to show how we got here. And then there are people on the ground who can come up with programs, et cetera. But I think there could be more of an overlap. I think this is coming from my gut. I'm just going to say, if all you think your job is, is to say there are racist foundations in the society. And what you really mean by that is, therefore, we need to have reparational payments paid to black people, because I As we've talked about, that seems to be a lot of what the code there is. Is that it? I mean, it just seems to me, you know, if you've got a journalism degree or you've got a Ph.D., you're working, you know, for a major media organ. Is that it that year after year after year you just say racism is structural, racism is structural, racism is structural? That's all. And maybe. Maybe because. I'm an odd Montessori kid who likes studying weird stuff just for the sake of it. And I mean it. I don't, I'm not saying I have an IQ of 300, but I'm hungry. I just like to grab around. I want to look at that and that, that Looney Tune and that president's wife and learn that language for no reason. But that, that feel, maybe I expect too much of people I'm talking about now who are brilliant in themselves, but it's the same message over and over. And this may be a little premature, but yeah, 1619 cannot be the response to something this urgent. Learn about at least one other thing, something about education, something about epidemiology, something where you have something to tell people. Like, I don't know where to put this. I'm almost done. I know from this city, and this is, this is over now. It changes every week, but talk about, say, three weeks ago, among less educated at members of the community, there were many people who had an idea. And you don't have to take it from me, people. Van Jones did a whole video about this, and he was quite right. A lot of people, like Black people in the Bronx, I know this from good authoritative anecdote from somebody who lives right there. There was an idea that the coronavirus was something that kills old white people. 
I heard that said a million times myself just around, including by a very famous person, as a matter of fact. And you say, yeah, okay. And it kind of seemed like that for about 10 minutes. And so in a lot of those neighborhoods where we had already been told the social distance, it wasn't happening, that changed. The message got out. But the question becomes how to avoid something like that happening again, how to get the message out so that there wasn't a two weeks where you had people playing basketball and bumping up all over each other while the NPR, New York Times people were already avoiding each other and walking around in masks. That's not the way it should have been. It wasn't those people's fault. But still, how do you fix that? And the response to that is not fucking 1619. And I just hope that our intelligentsia can be more creative than that. Yeah, you fix it by getting LeBron James to tell people that it's not true. Yeah. Uh, and, exactly. you know, raising, uh, getting George Soros to give you $10 million so that you can put it on every TV show it, station that, and radio station that Black people listen to. Yeah. Um, but, but this age thing is not irrelevant, you know, because it does kill older people, not just old white it people. It'll kill any old anybody, <laughs> including your humble servant here. And I ain't gonna let it happen. <laughs> I'm not old. I'm just I'm just getting better with age. That's all. You're august. <laughs> and and the point I want to make is, if you look at the age distribution, all you gotta do go to Google and type, uh, you know, age distribution by uh, race and ethnicity in America, and the table will pop up. Uh, that'll show you a chart and white people are older than black people significantly (laughs) interesting way of putting it than black people okay they're um, relative to the proportion of the population comparing whites to blacks the number of whites first of all black people don't live as long shorter life expectancy okay i mean this is a part of the burden of race in the country it's certainly a disadvantage uh, to not have a long life. And that's part of the disadvantage that African-Americans labor under, in part because of a history of racism, et cetera. I'm not being flippant about that. That's true. But uh, the other side of that is that there are more, relatively speaking, white people in their 70s and their 80s and in their 90s. And they're dying from this disease at higher rates than younger people, which means that there is a racial disparity adverse to whites relative to others in terms of the incidence of mortality from the disease, that's a pure consequence of the age distribution tables. Yeah. I, haven't heard, I haven't heard that mentioned anywhere. It, well, I don't read the, the uh, white supremacist press, so I don't know. They may be making a point of it, but, but you know, you know if, we, one if we're looking that, at disparities, that's one we ought to take on board. Excuse me. You know, one that um, nibbles at me, and here I'm talking about something where I don't I don't know what I'm talking about, or I know what I'm talking about a very little, is that you talk about how part of the problem is lack of access to health care among black people. And that would explain part of this age issue. But I doubt, some, yeah. sometimes with health issues, I also think about diet and what we're told. And you see this with a lot of these reports is that there are, there are these food ghettos that black people live in disproportionately where you just can't get good food. You can't get fresh vegetables. So you end up going to the bodega and eating potato chips and and pickles. And, you know, the, the data on that is really not friendly to that notion, which has now become just a truism. The truth is that people culturally have different dietary preferences and there's no reason why that wouldn't be true. Not of every black person on earth, but you know, of, of a great many black Americans. And often the supermarkets are quite nearby. You can buy kale for very little money, but there are people who eat in a certain way because that's the way they grew up eating. And that's what they like. They like that palate. I openly admit that that palate that I'm talking about now, if I could do it and not become unhealthy, I would eat that way every day. And I didn't grow up eating only that way, but you know, the chicken, the grease, I love that. I don't want Did you ever quinoa. watch the Boondocks uh, cartoon I saw show? most of it, yeah. So you know the yeah. one about the fried chicken uh, epidemic, the fried chicken flu? Yes, I forgot all about that. Yeah. <laughs> There's a whole, I mean, the thing is as funny as it can possibly be, right? Because people are going to eat their fried chicken no matter what. And he envisions yeah. a, a world in which, for some reason, fried chicken is carrying some virus that's making people sick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he's got loads of black people lining up outside the fried chicken place and trying to get their last <laughs> order in before they stop serving fried chicken. And regardless you know, and, of the health consequences of it. I mean, you could not get away with it if you were not a black TV <laughs> producer. Right. And you know, everybody laughs. But every, yeah. the laughter is partly because, you know, it's partly it's a fact. And so I wonder, I'm afraid that we can't have an honest conversation where we might say some of these health disparities were due to the fact that we like 
eating in this way, and we might want to be careful. So in it's obesity and, and, uh, and diabetes. Yeah. And, and I just want to say, yes. I don't want to imply that the obesity and the diabetes are only because of these dietary preferences, but I suspect they play a role, and you can, you know, and I, I remember Well, here's what you might do, John. Excuse me for interrupting. You might look at Southerners, because I think a lot of this – Right. Dietary practice is a Southern, South. yeah. not just a black, but a Southern thing. And you might compare blacks to white Southerners and look at what's eating going on in the white South time. already. Yeah. 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 And it's the same thing, obesity, the diabetes, the smoking. And part of it, it's partly health care, but I can't help thinking, isn't part of this just due to the way one might prefer to eat as a Southerner? And then you have to have a different conversation than 1619. And I'm, I get the feeling a lot of people wouldn't be open to that conversation. Okay, so now, not just a race thing here, uh, a general social policy thing. A lot of people are saying that um, this is proving the need for some kind of universal health care uh, because if we had that, uh, the people who are most disadvantaged would be better off. They'd have been better off in terms of care before the pandemic hit and they have more access to resources afterwards. I think that's right. You think it's going to change? Think- the debate about healthcare policy? Yes, I do. And I think that that is a really important thing, you know, to just say lots of other countries do it. That's not a resonant enough argument. And I think that Mr. Sanders was not the most advantageous person to be making the argument. He spread the word, but there are various (laughs) things that he had against him as a messenger. And frankly, with this, I think if one is interested, and you can see that it's my leaning, I understand the problems with it then something like this happening is a major argument for making it so that there aren't these disparities in access to health care and whether you can afford to be healthy. Because if this is going to keep happening, and I think it's quite clear this isn't the last time, you know, there's going to be something else, then obviously the health care system we have is not enough. And actually, I would be interested to see to what extent is it access. You know, we need to see that just for general purposes, because we would find out the extent to which people really can't afford to go to the doctor. That's certainly going on in this neighborhood from what I've read. And so, yeah, yeah, this is, this is, this is important. This virus is going to have very interesting repercussions on all sorts of things, but don't you think it's showing that? Or do you think it's too early to, to say? Well, I do. I mean, it's the worst thing that could happen in a world in which you have millions of people who don't have uh, who don't have insurance that a health, a public health emergency would happen and it exposes their uh, exposes their vulnerability. And so it must add to the weight of the argument that we need to configure our uh, public policy so that those people are protected. It does not make the argument for Medicare for all. I mean, that is to say the abrogation of private health insurance completely, uh, you know, the uh, cancellation of the good deals that you and I have because we work for Ivy League universities who take very good care of their employees. It doesn't make that argument that the health insurance industry needs to be, in effect, eliminated. Uh, but it does make the argument that people who are uh, vulnerable and don't have protection uh, deserve and uh, require uh, public policy that is moving in the direction of it getting them covered. So, so I think it, it certainly puts a thumb on the scale in that debate if it's not necessarily the Bernie Sanders position in that debate. Glenn, can I ask you a question? If you could blow up the healthcare system and just start again, would you include in the new system you built room for private as well as public insurance? Uh, I don't want to answer uh, definitively, because it's not, and I'm almost embarrassed to say, it's not something that I have thought carefully about. My gut answer is yes. Okay. Hmm. Uh, as, th- as an economist, why? Well, because uh, one size is not going to fit all, and I want to allow people who are prepared to devote their resources to it to get uh, better than the standard care if that's what they want. They're willing to pay for it. So, for example, you take Medicare. That's a universal program. Everybody over age 65 is eligible for it. I'm getting Medicare uh, benefits. Fine. Uh, but I can also buy a, uh, an insurance policy uh, that covers the gaps of Medicare coverage that uh, prov- provides me with additional benefits that Medicare doesn't provide. I've got the money to afford to do that. If I like to do that, that's my business. Um, I don't need the government telling me that I can't expand the protections if I'm willing to use my own resources to do so, even if the government is making sure that everybody has a basic level of care. So I'd say something like that, and that inclines me not to want to eliminate private insurance 
Uh, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's the case in um, uh, England with the National Health Service. I think it's the case in Canada. Again, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not an expert on this, that while there is universal coverage, there are also options for people who want to be able to uh, top that off uh, with extended right. benefits. And, yeah, it's interesting. Whenever I do look at the, the logging heads comments, I notice that um, there always there's some one thing one of us said, usually you, and like 65% of the discussion just is all about that one thing. And here, you know it's going to be this. And so I want to ask you one other thing. Sure, you can buy new stuff, but would you set it up so that a person, if they wanted to, could have their insurance taken care of through their company, and this probably being a better plan than, than Medicare alone if they, if they happen to be still working. Is that the idea? Or, you know, forget Medicare. The idea would be that there's a public option that everybody can use, but then you can also have your insurance taken care of through Brown, and it's a better plan than the general public option. Would you build that in? Well, no, not, not in the current uh, configuration, which gives a tax break to mm. the employer. He gets to deduct the cost of providing your medical care mm-hmm. uh, from his tax obligation. And so it's a subsidy for, so the employer is providing me with uh, a wage, but is also providing me with benefits like contributions to my pension and vacation time and uh, all the rest. And amongst that is uh, health care provided by the employer. I pay, but I'm paying well below market. So that's part of my compensation, but it's a part of the compensation that goes untaxed. Mm -hmm. I mean, the employer gets to credit the cost, but I don't have to pay taxes on the benefit. It's, 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 so it's a distortion in the relative valuation of the different ways in which the employer might try to provide me compensation. And that I would not mind seeing eliminated. Okay. 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 But, but if in negotiating with my employer, I were to say, look, here's how I'd like to be paid. I'd like you to give me this much uh, wages, but I'd also like you to give me this many days of vacation time. And I, and I'd like to, for you to do something for my, uh, uh, you know, skill enhancement. If I take a course, I want you to help to subsidize the cost of that. And I, and we're negotiating about what the thing is. And if I include the healthcare in that negotiation package between me and the employer, I would say, fine, I wouldn't prevent the employer from doing that or, more pointedly, I would not prevent a union and an employer from agreeing as a part of their collective bargaining arrangement that health care benefits would be provided by the employer to the union. But the reason we see that in contracts as much as we do is because in, it's, there's an implicit tax subsidy to the employer mediated provision of this benefit, mm-hmm. which, um, you know, is, is uh, something that I wouldn't uh, object to seeing eliminated. Okay, so these things are not as simple as, you know, Finland does it this way, and therefore, why shouldn't we? And that's, that's all there is. There's, there's more to it than that. There's a lot more to it than that. And it's been uh, worked to death by the, the whole argument that went on during the Obamacare debates and whatnot. And there are people who know 100 times more about it than I do, as will be clear already from what I've said so far. I just wanted to ask you about that. because No problem. You know, and, I, and I can take the flag. I heard music. Was that our soundtrack? Uh, that? No, that's somebody at my front door, and I don't feel obliged to answer it at the current time. <laughs> Believe me, they will, they're probably leaving a package from Federal Express or uh, Amazon Prime or something like that, and they just want me to know that it's there. They will come back. Believe me. Well, you know, here's another thing about COVID and race. I wonder if the next thing is going to be that the way people are being treated is um, – being affected by race, that black people are disproportionately getting lesser treatment for the disease and that that's part of why they're more deaths. It's one thing to say society has always been driven by inequality and that determines that more black people are dying. But it seems to me that next is going to be, like I'll say, I'm sure that people are looking for it and I wonder if they'll find it. They'll find that black people are less likely to get the kind of care that would keep them alive. And that strikes me as being the next thing. And I wonder if that'll be as easy a case to make. Maybe it'll just be a mic drop, but I, I'm worried that people are going to be in a sick way, hoping for it to be that way, wanting to find that. And when the data might not actually indicate it, we'll see. I don't know. Maybe yeah, it's a fair people. point to raise. Nicole Hannah-Jones does, in fact, mention the there's a long literature on health disparities. And part of it involves doctors having stereotypes about patients of color. Right. 
and pain not taking their complaints about pain as seriously. And I wonder whether access to testing uh, can be shown to be racially differential uh, in that a person with the same symptoms who's white more frequently gets referred to a, a coronavirus test because they're rationing access to testing. The symptoms, how bad do the symptoms have to be before you get tested? Does exactly. that depend upon your race? Uh, I have no knowledge about whether or not that's so. It's certainly possible that there could be discrimination of that sort. And the possibility has been mentioned by a couple of commentators already. Yeah, because there you could say that there's something racist about that which is going on right now. And I would be interested to know if there is, but I hope people are rigorous and don't go hoping to find something out of a sense that your job is to be a Cassandra about race. Because I think that in these times, all of us have other jobs. You know, there, there are a lot of things to be looked at. And so, yeah, I'm open to it if it turns out to be that way. But I hope it isn't. I hope people don't do creative massagings of the data where it gets to the point where a reasonable person might see it in a different way. But most reasonable people are afraid to say so because they're going to get called dirty names on Twitter. That's the sort of thing that I hope we don't. That's end up what seeing. peer review is supposed to protect us from in the academic literatures anyway. I mean, you can't stop what's printed in The New York Times, but you can't stop what's printed <laughs> in the Journal of the American Medical Association. I hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, John, what do you say we call it a conversation? Did yeah, you have something go. else you want to put on the table here? Not today, because I feel like we're on the break of something. You know, the rates of, of death, I can't believe we're having this conversation. The rates of death are going down in New York. I get the feeling we're entering a new phase, not to use that tunnel. You analogy mean that those who died yesterday fewer than those who died the day before yesterday kind of beginning thing? Beginning to go, go down. I sure is, hope is that, that does. Or is that, it hospitalizations? I think it's hospitalizations, but still, it's a sign that something maybe, is going Maybe, maybe turning a corner. Yeah, and I'd like to see what happens after that. But, um, yeah, I think I'm going to go make a ham sandwich for now. So It's lunchtime. Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, so thanks for coming but, on the show. Let's yeah. do it in another week or two because I'm for we that. both don't have anything to, anywhere to go. So let's do that. <laughs> That's true. Maybe we can talk about something other than COVID-19. Who knows? That would be welcome. <laughs> yeah, you're teaching your classes, I assume. I know I am. I'm sending them as podcasts to my students. I loathe teaching on Zoom. Loathe it. And I just told the students, no, you're just going to listen to me. I do podcasts as part of my living anyway. Now, so you're, a, you're actually doing live classes? No, I'm not doing live classes because people are scattered. It's hard to get a synchronous. And we were advised by our administration to try to avoid that. I'm putting up lecture, video lectures up right. on the uh, uh that's what website on uh, they can they can look at them at their leisure, but so I don't Brown know if anybody's told you looking. To do that? Brown Pardon? told you to do that. They said that it no, was. No, they advised. To... They advised. But they advised. They advised Columbia to did... not have synchronous class meetings huh. because, given the scatter of people, it might be yeah. hard for everybody to convene at the same time. You know, the rumor is, and it's just a rumor that the Ivies and then maybe about twenty other schools are encouraging actual live classes and that most other universities are saying what you just said, which is that people are all over the country, all over the world. You're not going to bring people in at one time. And I prefer that. I like what Brown, Brown's an Ivy, but apparently Brown's different. Columbia actually has a vision of us doing our classes live. And I just said, no, I'm not. It, 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 it's just too many people can't come. It's a very sterile atmosphere where I find it very hard to get myself across. And I figured just put a lecture up that anybody can listen to at any time. Now, if it's a seminar and you've got 12 young people, mm -hmm. that's one thing. If it's 80 in a lecture class, like what I'm teaching, doing it in a synchronous way where everybody is, you know, joining the meeting at 11 a.m., no, it's 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 kind of hard to do. And then you can't really have any discussion by, by that. No. It's very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. So um, I've abandoned that. But if I were teaching uh, a, a 10, 12, 15 member class and they were all in the continental United States, mm -hmm. you know, I might make it uh, two o'clock in the afternoon, East Coast, one, uh, 11 o'clock in the morning, West Coast and, and try to pull it off because the discussion, you know, the interaction amongst the students is very important for that kind of a class. You're better than me actually, because I do have a seminar like that. And I have given them very carefully crafted lectures. And I said, we can have discussions on the site, but I can't imagine doing what I do to foster discussion when I don't have them with me in the room. And I think a lot of people are saying, well, it's not quite as good, but it's a good substitute. And I just, I'm chilled at the thought 
of fostering a discussion among a bunch of Hollywood squares. I just, I, I can't see that working. And so I guess I have not been doing my job as a professor, but I've been sending them just me. And I figure you talk among yourselves and we'll see. I'm having it live when they do their in-class presentations, but not ah. but that's going to be discussion. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, we'll see you next time, John. Thanks for uh, giving us some of your time. Have a good one.